Hello, I'm Stephen Ryan. You are indeed, and I'm Matthew Lucas. Welcome to the Horticulturalists. We do post every week, Stephen. We certainly do, so do come on board. And hit subscribe to follow our continuing adventures. Now, today we have another story that you and Craig shot while we were still in lockdown, yeah. which we are no more. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating. I'm fascinated, and I think the viewers are. Tell us a little bit more. Set the scene. Set the scene. All right. Well, those who've been good subscribers and, and viewers will know that we've been doing some water features stories we as have, we've we been have. going along. We're upping the ante this week so we're going to talk about a comparatively large pond in yes. my garden yes. and how it came about, how it was built, uh, how we created the setting for it uh, and pretty well everything you need to know about installing a large pond. Very exciting. All right. Well, I think without any further ado, we should go to the pond and then we can talk about some of the questions I had on watching the footage. What a good idea. Lead on. And here we are. The, the This is not the largest pond, is it? No. We're working our way towards <laughs> that. <laughs> We're working our way to glory. So let's have a look at some of the footage that you and Craig made a couple of weeks ago. And yep. I've got some questions for you. All right. Good idea. Well, we've already done a couple of videos about water in the garden. We've got one on really small water features, we've got one on slightly bigger water features. And this week, we're going to talk about my larger ponds in the garden, and we'll link you to those other videos so that you can see what they're all about. This is the smaller of my two large ponds, if that makes any sense. It has goldfish in it, which keep down the mosquitoes. But of course, if you put goldfish in a pond, then you're unlikely to get tadpoles and frogs because they'll also eat the tiny tadpoles. So you need to keep that in mind. This pond is lined with one of those black bitumous liners and it's very well disguised. And the way I disguised it was to make sure that I had shelves around the edge where plants could be grown. And then the actual bitumous liner goes straight down into the water below those shelves so that there's no sign of being able to see it. It's really important because if you have a pond where the liner goes in like that, you'll always see part of it and it's very hard to disguise. So if you can dig your pond out in that way, that's a great idea. This pond is fed from the stormwater from the house. So every time it rains, it helps top up this pond. And it's quite deep as well. Now there's a couple of reasons for having a deep pond as far as I'm concerned. One is the more depth you've got to a pond, the safer your fish are and the less evaporation that you tend to get. And also in Southern Victoria, we're in a bushfire prone area and having a deep body of water gives me volume. And I know that if I put my fire pump in this water, I will take about four hours to empty this pond. So it is quite a large volume of water. It's been planted, but with all sorts of interesting things around the margins uh, to try and give it a sense of being a natural pond without in fact, just filling it up with common rushes and reeds and so forth. So there's a fair few plants of interest here. So what are some of the plants that I've used around my pond? We did a video about one of the plants earlier, and we'll again link you to that video, and that's some Keltha palustris subspecies, palustris, which is sometimes sold around the traps as polyphylla. It's the giant marsh marigold, and it hangs out into the water, gives great refuge for the fish. The other plants around the pond include things like Allegia capensis, the South African thatching rush, which gives a wonderful, tall, statuesque, fluffy look to the garden, so I love that. And then I've included some big leafed plants like uh, Farfugium japonicum, which is growing underneath my willow tree, and also the beautiful purple foliage of Persicaria red dragon, which gives colour virtually all year round. And although it's herbaceous, as soon as you cut it down in the winter, it starts to send up new growth. So I've always got that patch of purple around the pond. This pond's in a fair bit of shade due to the big contorted willow that grows over the top of it. And the roots of the willow and a lot of the other plants that are growing around it are actually out in the water. And they also give habitat for the fish. So this is a really nice habitat pond in my garden. Another feature with this pond is our little waterfall. All we've done is we've built a dry stone wall up on the inside of the liner, so it's all inside the pond, and we've put in a small submersible pump. And it recycles water up through a pipe behind the wall, and then it just comes out as this little tiny flow that gives a nice gentle sound. You've got some great still images, which I'm going to play over here because they really show the construction process. Yep. And that point you made about stepping the bank so it doesn't go straight down, I was a little confused by that. But yep. you can see from this picture here quite clearly. 
So two things. Firstly, is that step below the waterline? The, the steps around the edge of the pond are actually at different levels. Yep. Some of them are actually below what I hope is the high water level. Yep. Some of them are actually below it. Yep. Uh, the reason being, of course, is that I can then grow actual water plants on the lower leveled ones so that they're in the water. Yep. And I can have bog plants on the higher ones so that they're actually up and out of the water a fraction. So that's the thinking behind the those ledges. Okay, that makes sense to me. And in some of these pictures, you can see that you've so you've used a plastic or a rubberized lining yeah and then in places you've lain on it um on the step things like tree fern stem and other organic matter mm. and i wondered were you just weighing it down or was that some kind of bigger plan oh no definitely bigger plan when yes. it comes to me it's always bigger plan always considered Stephen yeah. Ryan. now you do have to hold the soil back on those ledges yep. uh, for growing things in immaterial whether they're below water or above and I had access to some dead tree fern logs. Died during the millennial drought, planted in the wrong place. I never waste a tree fern log. There's always something you can do with tree fern logs. Good to remember, never waste a tree fern. Yes, keep them. Um, now, the reasons I use tree fern logs are multitudinous. Yep. The first one is if you use rock, it's very hard to disguise the rock. And if you've got a row of rocks sitting along the top of a ledge, it looks very like shark's teethy sort of things. <laughs> do and not go into that water. No, it's not a good look, I don't think. So you spend a lot of time trying to disguise it. If you use the tree fern logs and then backfill with soil behind those, one, they're a little less conspicuous immediately, yeah. but also they're fibrous and things will grow in them and through them and over them. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. you get little ferns germinate in them. You get your bog plants grow down and over and through them. Right. And so then your edges of the pond absolutely do disappear. And they look much more natural because that's sort of mimicking a natural environment. Exactly. So the other question is then you're using this thick lining does it puncture? Has yours ever punctured? Yes, it did once. Yes. Uh, we decided to empty the pond at one stage, yep. several years after it was installed, thinking that, we'd clean it out. That would be a task, but yeah. anyway. Yeah, so we did, we did this, we emptied it out. But unfortunately, what we hadn't taken into consideration, because as you can see from the photographs, we've actually made the sides of the pond very steep vertical yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason being that you then can't see the liner through the water if the liner goes that way you've got a chance of seeing the black liner uh -huh. so by going straight down you don't see the liner but you hadn't reinforced those no excavations. and so once the water came out the pressure was off and a small part of the bank actually collapsed behind the liner yeah. which wouldn't have mattered terribly much had it not been for a root of a dead tree stump that was in the higher side of the garden mm. then suddenly being exposed so when we filled it up with water it just pressed against this tree root and it popped ah, straight through right so we had to have it or well, we had to get in behind the liner cut the tree root off fill back with some sand behind it uh, and patch the liner but like, it can be done like a bicycle tire basically the same sort of process and how long has that been in situ now the pond has been here for around about eight or nine years. Yeah. And as far as I know, the liners have something like a 20 year guarantee, but are likely to last much longer than that. As long as you don't throw a pitchfork in the, in the water at some point. Well, we shan't. No. Mm. It was such a glorious day when you shot, unlike today, and you certainly had wild hair during <laughs> lockdown, Stephen Wright. But bigger question, you did briefly mention the notion of bushfires and having bodies of water available. Yep. So perhaps for some viewers who aren't in areas that might be susceptible to bushfires or other viewers that are, yes. just tell me again about the reasoning for that or how you have or haven't used that water or in an emergency. Well, I haven't used it in an emergency yet. Luckily, well <laughs> yes, done. keep our fingers crossed. Uh, but the idea when we put the ponds in was to make the bodies of water big enough yep. so that there would be volume there. Yep. It also means that you get less evaporation. So the deeper the water is, the less evaporation you get, the cooler the water stays. That's science. Yes. But it, we bought fire pumps uh, and it takes about four hours to empty this pond. Yeah. So when a fire front comes through, if we decided that we were going to stay or we were trapped here and couldn't get out, um, we've got the fire pumps ready to go. We can set them up. We can set them going. We've got huge impact sprinklers that uh, will cover meters and meters and meters. And so we can set them going and leave or we can set them going and use that water to try and protect the house. And we've got two fire pumps because we've got two big 
ponds. The other pond is even larger. We have never tried to empty that, but I'd say we've got probably six or eight hours worth of water in that. Most fire fronts go through in the first 15, 20 minutes or so. Mm. Uh, if we can keep the fire at bay for that length of time, we could potentially protect ourselves if we got trapped here. And there have been cataclysmic fires in this area. Oh yes, in fact, this land we stand on, I bought as a burnt out block after the big fires of 1983, the Ash Wednesday bushfires. Mm. The people who'd owned the house that was on the block originally had decided to relocate and just wanted to be quit of it. Mm. So I bought the block of land and built on it. There you go. Now, the other thing I noticed in some of these pictures, which I'll show you now, is that you can see, as you're excavating, a really good cross-section of the soil, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's very clay-like. Yes. But you can also see this, it's a good 30 centimetres or a foot of fabulous brown, friable-looking soil. I'm presuming that is all your good work. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the soil, what you could laughingly call soil down at the lower it levels, which... very... It's clay. Clay, it compacted, is. nutritionless, difficult for roots yeah. to penetrate. Yep, it's just yellow clay. And that is basically the soil that was on our whole block. And really? I think at some stage, we might in fact do a segment on how we created soil, which I, might be a good... Yes, we need to do a piece on soil because it's all about soil health and yep. it's vitally important. And you have turned this area around from seeing that sectional image mm you can just see the work that went into it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I always laughingly say to people when they visit the garden that when I first started, my topsoil was the gray smudge under the gum leaves that were lying on the ground. So, and, and quite literally, that was basically what it was. There was mm. no topsoil. I don't think there ever was, but if there had been, it was probably scraped off with the remnants of the house that burnt down in the Ash Wednesday fires. <sighs> well, we won't go into that now because I think we have to do a whole other soil story. Yeah, why not indeed? There we are. How fantastic. Those images of you making the pond are quite something. It was quite a feat of engineering. It was a feat of engineering and a guy with a backhoe can do an awful lot in a very short time. Goodness me, yeah. yes. And now it's just so beautiful. And we did do a piece about the giant marsh marigold. Is that That's the name? growing in the pond. Yes, yes, well done. We will link that. And Stephen, what could we possibly do next week? Well, it could be an even bigger pond. <laughs> it could be. Yes. So hit subscribe and follow our endless journeys if you want to see Stephen's bigger pond. Yeah. See you next week. Bye all.